Hello, I I'm Faris and um, I'm Rosie's husband. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Genius Deals and I'm the author, I'm an author now, of a book called Paid Attention, which came out this week. Um, I'm Rosie Jacob. I am the other founder of Genius Deals. Together we make up a hopefully dynamic duo that runs an itinerant consultancy where we help brands solve business problems using creativity. We've been living on the road for 110 weeks and counting, so we might be coming to a city near you soon. Yes, we might. <laughs> we might indeed. You can invite us, then we will come. Yeah, if you invite us, we'll definitely come. There you go. I started out as a management consultant. I wore a suit, I had shorter hair, and aspects of that I found very satisfying. Uh, there's some intellectual rigor to strategy consulting that I quite enjoyed, but ultimately I couldn't deal with not being able to wear trainers. Ended up in advertising, and in advertising I've been most things. So I've been a media planner, a brand strategist, a digital strategist, and a, a creative director. I became Chief Digital Officer of McCann Erickson, a very non-digital firm at the time. After that, I joined a holding company as their Chief Innovation Officer, and that gave me the scope to start a digital company, um, thinking I wanted to make more digital things. And then three years after that, I sold my stake, proposed to my wife, sold all my stuff, and took to the road. Right, well tomorrow I'm giving a talk called Idea Networks and Media Bosons. Um, it's going to be about how ideas are new combinations of things. That our company is called Genius Steals because we believe that no idea is original, that originality is a nonsensical concept invented by romantic poets in the 18th century, frankly. Um, ideas are new combinations of things. Ideas are inherently networked to other ideas. Like the way your memory is stored associatively, so all concepts exist associatively in a network of culture and the way you get new ideas, or what seems to be new, is by finding different pieces that are non-obviously related and connecting them in some interesting way. And the, the media boson thing, um, uh, a hadron, a Higgs boson is a kind of boson that Higgs postulated would exist and now they think probably does exist. So fermions are what stuff is made of. Fermions are the particles that make quarks, that make electrons, that make a protons, make, that make stuff, right? Bosons transfer force. So a boson isn't a particle in the sense of it, you don't get made of bosons. Bosons are the mechanism by which the universe physically communicates force across itself, supposedly. So there are bosons for force, for mass, for gravity. That's how force gets communicated. And my conceit in tomorrow's talk is that media are the bosons of human behavior that media allows us to communicate behavioural influence across distance in the same way that a boson does for a subatomic particle. Until now-ish, the internet has been something of text, of video, of media, you know, of utterance, if you like. And as we move towards the sort of ubiquitous surveillance, internet of enabled things, I posit the idea that we're moving towards an internet of behaviour where utterance becomes less important and behavior, actual physical movement and interaction becomes more important. And I wonder what that's gonna look like. At the biggest level, uh, the NSA or a mobile phone company can tell you how humanity moves with almost perfect detail. You are being constantly tracked, right? So, for example, it's uh, really easy to predict behavior in human beings. Most human beings have very predictable behavior patterns. They wake up, they commute, they go to work, they commute home. That's it. So you can predict where someone's going to be 90% of the time with almost perfect accuracy. At an aggregate level, swarms of people have very strange behavioral systems. To understand experience design, you need to understand spaces 
how you fit into spaces and how you operate within them. So, and I'll, again, tomorrow I'll talk about this, but we went to Disney World recently. If you've not been to Disney World recently, go to Disney World immediately because as a field trip, expense it to your, because if you're a designer, you don't, you need to understand how this works now because seamless, personalized experiences are what is currently happening at Disney World. So it isn't even me saying the future. This is something you can do now with my bracelet, you know? Um, so extrapolate that from Disney World and my bracelet to my phone and everything that exists. How do you design experiences when everything can talk to you and tell you where you are and tell you what you're doing um, beyond just spamming people with coupons because you're near their shop, which is what everybody ends up developing as the primary use case, which is just a horrible way to think about um, proximity-based marketing in my opinion, but hey, that's me. We've shifted from uh, metaphors of location to, to metaphors of time and fluidity. So sites become streams, the homepage becomes the stream, right? Um, if you look at how Yahoo and YouTube and Twitter and Facebook have redesigned the experience of a website, if it doesn't move downwards, fast, it's just boring. I steal it. All my ideas are stolen, hence Genius Steals. I'm inspired mostly by two things, my wife and my traveling. Without my wife, I wouldn't do anything, and without travel, I wouldn't want to do anything. <laughs> um, but everything else is stolen. I mean, and I'm dedicated about this. Like, my, the footnotes took such a long time in my book because it's important to me to recognize as much as I am humanly able that everything is from somewhere and I'm just piecing it together as a little, you know. I heard a word today, one of the speakers said there's a word called kleptonesia, where you've stolen something but you don't remember you stole it so you think you had the idea yourself. <laughs> I would extend that into every idea you think you've had, you have not had. You've simply seen two things and your brain found a way to connect the two things, you know, and that's a magical ability but it doesn't start from nothing, you know. The, um, the mythological idea of creativity, even in ancient Greece, you know, Athena is born fully formed from the mind of Zeus in what's an obvious creative metaphor, right? Athena is the goddess of creativity in one of them. So, um, fully formed, because that, you know, the idea just appears. Oh, that's it, the idea, you know. Uh, but it's just because your brain doesn't expose the way it's working to you. We believe that originality is a myth and that nothing comes from nothing. That's why our company is called Genius Steals. Yeah. And so we're often looking around in unusual places or unlikely places for sources of inspiration. It's not limited to the advertising world. We think that copying is lame, but we think that... Copying is um, dishonest, that's why. Stealing, yeah. stealing in our you know, schema of language is not dishonest. It, exposes its debt, it uses the reference, it says this is the reference, I'm using it, I'm putting it in here. Co and hopefully it makes is, it better and yeah, builds upon right, it. Yeah, exactly. Copying is passing off. You know, you see something, you pretend you did it, and that's, that's just, it's, it, it's immoral and emotionally unsatisfying and also lame. Yeah. All of those things. So I think when you have a creative partnership, um, there are plenty of people who work in creative industries like myself. I don't necessarily have uh, a design skill set, though I'm, I'm getting better, but I advocate on behalf of the creative people. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really important to have either that person in your partnership or within your network, especially if you're a freelance or independent designer, mm -hmm. you need someone who both understands and values what you do, but who can, or, or what you are doing or trying to do, but who can also advocate on your behalf and speak the language to the clients. Yeah. Um, wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever industry you're in, you'll always have clients. And instead of them being your enemy, they're the ones who are paying you, hopefully, good money. And if they're not paying you good money, even more of a reason to have someone advocate on your behalf. Um, so I like to think that a lot of times I'm translating all of the fun stuff that we get to do into that kind of logical, reason-based reason, reason -based and rational, okay, why is this valuable to your business client? Why would you pay That's money for That's a really it? important point. So um, the advocacy thing is part of it, but also it's, I guess, strategic triage, right? So somebody at some point in the process has to decide if that's the right solution or not. And that's part of what we believe strategy is about. Strategy has to decide if I'm going to allocate resources into uh, a website, a print ad, or a logo, what do I do first and why? Because if I ask a logo designer, I know what they're going to tell me. If I ask a website maker, I know what they're going to tell me. If I ask an agency, I know what they're going to tell me. Yeah. Because if they didn't, they'd be shooting themselves in the bottom line. 
shoot themselves in the bottom line on the nose. Um, but so we don't do that. We don't sell websites or logos or advertising. We sell solutions and part of that is thinking through the problem and then hopefully finding a solution. Yeah, I think that the place where we are in now, and especially for independent designers, you get to approach things from slightly more of a solution perspective instead of a menu of options of what makes you the most money, which is one of the big problems with big agencies these days. They want to make for the client what they're good at making instead of what solves those problems. For any independent designer out there, you have the ability to be a little bit more media neutral, more solutions focused, and if you are having trouble articulating that, finding an, an advocate, even if it's someone who you know who's not going to formally transition that, that uh, you know, golden nugget of what you do to a client, getting some tips of, okay, here's what I do, can I give it to you in layman's terms, and can you explain to yeah. me back what might be a business case for it? I do this all the time for friends. I'm more than happy to do that because I'm excited about making the world a better place through creativity. Yeah, and to bring it all back to the beginning, the guy Alex from Coca-Cola Company this morning was talking about design outside of design. Design as business solutions, design as experience engineering, design as design as being something that should be on the the board level of thinking about holistically about the customer journey, about the complexity of the mediascape, and how designers have the skill set of making sense of complexity and making it fit together in a way that strategic that strategists do the same thing strategically, I think, that designers do creatively. So that <laughs> is good. It works pretty well because we have complementary skill sets and so we each think that we're, the other person is doing the harder job. Which no, is, you do an impossible job in my opinion. I so, think yeah. you do the impossible job which is why uh, I think it works so well. A lot of times people are competing and we both we have a little friendly competition every now and then but for the most part any kind of creative partnership works best when you both feel like the other person is the one that you're slightly in debt to. Mm. So I do think, I mean, there is some sort of I like brainstorms, I like group creativity, I like collaboration, but I think there is something about the partnership model which seemed, you mentioned Lennon and McCartney earlier briefly, right, or touched on it. Famously, they were quite good together. And then separately, well, Lennon had some good stuff, but McCartney not as much, right? No offense, Paul, or anything. Um, <laughs> we keep each other honest, I guess, as well. Yeah, and uh, also I defer in areas that I'm not good in, you know? So it used to be when I started out, I'm a bit older than Rosie, I'm kind of been doing this a bit longer, um, I would try and weigh in and then I realized pretty quickly that things like, um, anything to do with the business actually, I can't touch, it makes me anxious. I'm not business minded in the sense of running it myself. I can give consultative advice very easily, but. Um, well, I think we heard uh, Swiss mess Tina Roth Eisenberg this morning say, trust is the place where the magic happens. It's one of the greatest compliments you can give people. Yeah. And we get this question a lot, you know, how do you work as a couple? How does that actually, work because you guys see each other all the time and I guess one thing is just that we genuinely in addition to being in love are in like Aww. with each other but it's so much easier of course the person that you're married to or that you have a relationship with you trust inherently. We've been living on the road together for 110 weeks so from that time we quit our job and yeah. yes for the most part minus a few instances here and there where <laughs> we're apart it's, we find ourselves telling each other the same stories, but we also yes. end up in places like France and have no friends when we arrive and then host two dinner parties and attend one on the way. So we're very good at making impromptu friendships. You've got to get good at talking to other people or you go, we'll go crazy. Like it's, <laughs> you have to get at it. Like that's true.